uh, a team will reach out to you and, and uh, show you how to use the analysis filter. All right, let's go ahead and get started. <coughs> Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the GPN Technologies Year in Review and Planning for 2019 webinar series. My name is Kathy Furman, and I will be your moderator today. We are so excited you could join us to get ready for record-breaking success in 2019. Today is part four, track and measure the performance numbers that really matter. We will look at how you can use Edge Pro to evaluate the key performance indicators in your practice and give you suggested routines for continued review of these important metrics. Due to the number of attendees today, everyone is currently muted. At the bottom of your screen, you will see a control panel with a chat feature. If you have any questions, please ask them here. At the end of today's webinar, we will be putting a five link question survey into this chat area as well. Jay Binkowitz will be leading our discussion today. Jay is the co-founder of GPN Technologies, as well as co-founder and executive vice president of business strategy for Total Eye Care Partners. Over the last 30 years, Jay has had extensive experience in retail operations, merchandising and marketing, manufacturing and distribution, technology development, national sales, and on-site interactive consulting. Mr. Binkowitz served two years as the Benedict Professor at the Houston College of Optometry and remains as an adjunct professor there. He has published articles in many eye care industry magazines and is a keynote speaker at many industry events both domestically and internationally. We are also pleased to be joined today by our industry guest speaker, Dr. Larry Golson. Dr. Golson is a graduate from the Southern College of Optometry and currently has a two doctor practice in an artisan line optical in downtown Asheville, North Carolina. He also has a passion for his service and has gone on many optometric related mission trips as well as helping his local Lions Club. Dr. Golson uses Edge Pro on a routine basis to look at his key performance indicators to assist in the day to day management of his practice. Now, welcome, Jay Binkowitz. Hey, everybody. Uh, a lot of fun to be here. I'm really, really pleased to be here with Larry Golson. Hey, Larry, before we get started, I just wanted to ask you a question about Asheville. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I hear you loud and clear. Hey, great. So uh, in Asheville, do you have a microbrewery in the exam room? <laughs> we have one just outside the exam room. After the patients finish with their exam, they can pour themselves a beer. <laughs> I know Asheville's got their reputation for all that kind of fun stuff. Hey, uh, <clears throat> Kathy, we're going to switch the screen to my screen now? Yes, you can go ahead and switch screens. Yes, sir. Okay, so um, we're going to continue. And let's see if we have our technology right here. So I'll rely on all of you to let me know if we're looking at Billy Bean. <clears throat> are we seeing Billy? Yes, we are. Okay, so everybody should be up and running. Um, well, I'm going to start off a little bit uh, by talking about Billy Bean. I, I had the pleasure of meeting Billy Bean. I don't know uh, how many of you, and, and uh, hit us with the chat line if you can. How many of you uh, saw the movie uh, Moneyball with Brad Pitt? So uh, <clears throat> love to see uh, how many of you in the, answer yes in the chat line to, to tell us about that. Um, so we've got a few people there. Great movie, great movie. Well, you know, I was very intrigued when I saw that movie. And <clears throat> of course, Billy's famous uh, for changing the world of baseball. And, um, and how did he change the world of baseball? Well, you know, he got together with a smart, a smart guy, although Billy's pretty smart himself. And uh, <clears throat> he just sat back and said, you know what? There's got to be another way of analyzing the players and the value of the players and who uh, they should be making those investments in. And <clears throat> it all came down to one real strategic KPI. This one KPI, not only did it bring him to, to almost uh, win the series, uh, but it, it actually changed baseball forever and how everybody looks at the value of a player. <clears throat> this particular KPI, if many of you remember, was do they get on base? How often do they get on base? It wasn't how many home runs they had. It wasn't all the other fun thousand KPIs that they look at in baseball. It was 
can they get on base? <clears throat> and just to think about all the different metrics involved in, in sports today, in so many different sports, and yet it all boiled down to this one. And with this one number, he went out and selected a team that kicked butt. Uh, and, and so we have to think about that one number for ourselves. And that's why I brought it up here and I encourage all of you who have not had the opportunity to see this movie, to see it. Um, it was a lot of fun. <clears throat> your practice has a heartbeat, trying to measure your practice success without considering KPIs, pretty much like expecting your doctor to tell you how you're doing without checking your heart rate or your blood pressure or anything else. Can't be done. Now, I've never been a believer in leaving things up to faith. I don't allow faith to enter my team, and you should not either, is my opinion. And, but you do allow faith onto your team if you're not checking your KPIs and you're not really working on your business as well as in your business. <clears throat> and I think Larry, uh, much that I, I, know, I know Larry personally for many years, and Larry's the greatest example of someone who works on his business and in his business. Larry, can you share a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. I started my practice uh, 10 years ago with myself and two employees, and uh, we've grown quite a bit over the years till uh, now I have another doctor and about uh, 13, 14 uh, employees total. And uh, it was where I was seeing all the patients and really kind of didn't leave or have enough time to work on the practice. And over the years, have kind of backed myself out of direct patient care to a large degree so that I can work, work on the business instead of within it. I still see patients, uh, but I also work with uh, the other doctor and the individual team members to help get the peak performance out of each of us. Uh, it, and it's a lot of thinking that goes on, um, and a lot of information that's needed. One of the things that, that I've uh, kind of focused myself on is understanding what I refer to as relational information. It's not just a static number of a benchmark. Benchmarks are very difficult for me because it's, it's static. You don't know how they were built. It's understanding the relationships that built the benchmark. To me, you know, those became really, really important in how you put the puzzle together. And in my own secret sauce, it was understanding you know, by doctor, by staff member, by plan, by date range, and we could drill it down to products and services and fees, but understanding how these pieces meld together. And what Larry and I are going to talk about today uh, with the utilization of Edge Pro is how we look at the relationships that you're able to see and quite frankly how quickly and easily you can see it. So we're going to jump in here a little bit. And um, <clears throat> by the way, uh, my picture on the screen, my picture is the guy on the right hand side with the full head of hair and Larry's <laughs> on the left hand side. Um, so <laughs> hey, so first thing we're going to look at is business overview. Um, quick, easy place. So you can see where the button is right on top. And I, and I love uh, the bar on top because, you know, three buttons and, and you can find out just a wealth of information. It's all right in front of you. So if you click on business overview and then you click on overview, overview summary, it's going to take you to this screen here. And then I want you to just set the date range you want to look at. You know, very often I'll look at a month or I'll look at a quarter or I might look at year to date or I might even kick back and look at last year. But you can play anywhere you want up here, and you'll see this date range bar on all the screens, so it gives you total flexibility. So as, as we're looking through here, I want us to take a look at this top three boxes here that discuss total revenue and the revenue broken up by clinic and optical, and it shows three green arrows. So obviously, we're up $127,000. This is a very significant practice. It's a $2 million practice, and 74000 of it came from the clinic and 52,000 of it came from the optical. And these are net numbers. So mind you that when you're looking at the Edge Pro, that you're seeing the true numbers. You're seeing what's really happening. You're not seeing gross numbers and then have to calculate for write-offs or, or discounts and all that fun stuff. You're getting down to the, to the real nitty gritty on this stuff. Um, but what's also interesting for me on this screen and even more important than the top one is the bottom one, which is average revenue per exam. So even though on top, it showed that we were up $127,000, what we didn't know what was happening is that the value of the interactions that we were having with our patients was going down. So we all get really happy when you know, we put more money in the bank and grow our businesses, but if the value of the interaction that you're having with the patients going down while your revenue is going up, 
that's not a happy scenario, right, Larry? Absolutely, Jay. Uh, you know, I look at this and, you know, similar to what you said, I get excited about the total revenue, clinic and optical revenue all being up. And then I would be a little bit disappointed uh, at the next row of columns because, you know, it's, it sounds like we're, it seems like this practice is working harder um, to make less money per patient. And so it's one of those things where uh, what, well, the question I would start asking is what's causing that? Yeah, exactly. And, and that's what's critical here when we're looking at this information is to know that we should even ask a question. Um, you know, very often people just don't need to know that they're just looking at these top numbers saying, hey, we're doing good without seeing this going on. Now, overall in the clinic, we're, we're pretty flat. 67 cents is flat and optical is down $4.15. There are a few things that can affect this. And, and so we have some great buttons here where we could sort by plan or we could sort by doctor. Um, and the reason that this is important, this is drilling down further. Um, now, I tell you that if, if you have you know, green across the board is what I like. You got six green signs here. Everything you're doing is, is, is moving in the right direction. But, you know, like, like Larry and I just mentioned, if, if you see some red, you, you got to find out why. Now, it is possible that the reason why we have some red here is because you might have had an influx uh, of a particular plan where the reimbursements and the patient base spends money, the reimbursements are less, patients spend less money. And so it's changing up your average. But you need to know that's happening. So that this might be your new norm. Uh, but by sorting by plan in the top right button, you'll be able to see the influence of the plans on this number. Um, you know, an, another thing that contributes to this, Larry, that, that I've found is sometimes labor. Sometimes we see so many more patients, we're really not prepared uh, scheduling-wise for our own team. We, don't, we didn't hire any extra people. We expect our team to just you know, absorb the new patient flux and there's just not enough time to take care of a patient. Have you found that? Yeah, that's a great point to bring up. And I love how the edge will break it down by plan, by doctor, um, to look at this information in depth, to really dig down and figure out what's happening. But we found at one point in our own practice, we had grown so quickly that actually our opticians didn't have enough time to spend with each patient. They were running from one patient to the next. Uh, so their, their time with each individual patient was less. And then we actually were able to, were not able to provide as many uh, materials to each individual patient. So although we were seeing more patients and felt, you know, really great for being scheduled out, we we're actually less effective uh, per patient because we didn't have the adequate time to spend with them. Uh, exactly. Such a delicate balance. And, and but, you know, again, with, with, this, with the screen here, the overview, at least let you know what's going on. Uh, a couple of years ago, we worked with a practice that had an unbelievably busy optical, and they were in a city location, and they had a lot of walk-in. So they that practice had a, you know, a significant uh, ebb and flow during the day that could not be predicted. Um, and we, you know, and they were talking about getting more opticians, and we came up with the suggestion that they hire an optical admin. And the only job of that optical admin was to input the jobs and collect the money. And they, that person was just dedicated to the optical team. And, um, and what ended up happening is they ended up alleviating the pressure because we know it takes four, six, eight more minutes once the transaction's done to get in the computer and complete the, the financial uh, uh, requirements with the patient. So we were able to pick up those minutes with giving them an assistant. Uh, and this one assistant was shared by the entire optical team, and we were able to change our numbers from that. So those are the type of considerations you want to consider when you're looking at these type of numbers. But I will tell you candidly that revenue per exam, and you can write this down for 2019, is one of my main, main go-to numbers. It's the secret sauce number. Um, <clears throat> as we go a little further, we're going to look at our opportunities tab now. Again, it's just to the button that's right of business overview. And when you click on opportunities, you see on the top that you have the opportunity to set the date range, as we discussed before. And the first thing we see here is patients own frames. Well, <clears throat> this has always been a pet peeve of mine. Um, I know everybody's got their own little quirks they look for. But this page in general, the opportunities page, was designed to uh, really uh, bring forward the four areas that most practices uh, stumble with at some point. And, and I always believe that if you only did four things for the whole year you did, uh, and you did one thing per quarter, you would be successful by the end of the year. 
Uh, right up here, it's showing us that our patient's own frame percentage is at 22%. And that's a pretty high number. Uh, my my uh, mark on that's about 15%, anything, you know, 15% or, or less. So in this case, it's, it's explaining to us that if we just achieve the goal of 17%, which is only a 5% improvement, we would put another $21,000 in the bank. Larry, how have you handled patients' own frames and those types of situations in your own practice? Yeah, we usually um, will talk to our opticians about what happens when a, a patient sits down and says, I just want to put lenses in my existing frame. And, you know, the questions that we ask uh, to the patients and associated oftentimes with the, the entitlement that they have on their vision plan. And so uh, first we start by kind of finding out what they're doing currently. And from there, we work on scripting to kind of uh, dial in how we want to address those certain situations uh, moving forward. Once we have the scripting in place, we're going to role play that with, uh, with, our, with our team and practice it so that when we go on stage and we're actually with the patient, uh, we can say it very naturally and cohesively. So, um, so really it comes down to uh, kind of looking at what we're doing now and, what we, and how we want to be doing it. And then from there, we start watching uh, the edge to see how, you know, how our training has impacted the numbers. I, I love that. And I love the scripting and role playing. For me, they are, they're so, so critical to create consistency and the messaging that we deliver to our patients. I know everybody, you know, feels odd about it. I've, I've seen so many fun stuff, but I've also seen people really make a game out of it. Uh, we had some practices that recorded each other while they were role playing and they did some funny ones. They did some spoofs on what they shouldn't do and they did some the right way and they actually made the recordings and they use those as their training materials. So they actually learned to have a lot of fun with it, but <clears throat> excuse me, I love the scripting and, and role playing. The, the second number here <clears throat> I want to bring out is zero dollar frames. So right below the patient's own frames, what we call zero dollar frames. And the definition of zero dollar frames are is patients that are that have a plan and there are many different plans and don't spend any money on a frame. So we give them a frame for whatever's included in the plan. In this case, 32% of these patients are not spending any money on frames. So that's a huge number. Um, again, for me, that number needs to be below 15%. So uh the edge goal is setting a criteria to just improve by 5% here, which would put an extra $16,000 on the table. And as, as we look at some of the other items on here, I'm just going to make a note with my highlighter here, if I could do this correctly. Um, you know, we have an anti-reflective area here. Um, it shows us it's 87%, which is really a good number. When you're upwards of 90%, that's a pretty good number. And I know that some folks do even better than that. Um, so I'm going to not think about this number for a moment, um, but I am going to jump down here to transition lenses. We're at 28% here. Um, the national average 25. So again, this is a very good number. It doesn't mean your AR percentage can't be better and the transition lenses can't be better, but I'm going to tell you that these are pretty fair, fair numbers. So for me, from the four items that we're demonstrating here, two of them are significant. Patient's own frames and zero dollar frames. The other things that affect those, by the way, everybody, is, is your frame selection. You know, you, know you, you need to sit down and sit like Larry does with his team and ask, you know, what's going on here? My favorite question is, do we have the product the patients are asking for? Um, you know, and or how much would a patient be willing to spend? We found out through GPN Consulting that many patients, majority of patients, would spend between $29 and $39 out of pocket when they were coming in and saying, I don't want to spend any money. So then the question is, what product would you offer for that? But as we summarize this screen, we had 21,000 on top and 16,000 on the bottom in opportunities, which is a total of $37,000 in your pocket just for a 5% improvement, which is just a baby step, just a baby step. So again, that's why we call this the opportunities area, and we like folks to focus on it. And you know, this is um, a second footstep in the sand, so to speak as the things that I like to see as we go moving on to set goals. Um, the next area that Larry and I are gonna look at is your clinic overview. And um, clinic overview leads to contact screen, which is a new tool um, for, uh, for us. 
And I'm going to let Larry uh, talk a little bit here because we have so much information. Larry, tell me a little bit about how you use all this great information. Yeah, I really like this contact lens uh, screen that, that the Edge added. Uh, you know, particularly what I like about it is the year supply uh, percentage. And, you know, we compare that to the contact lens exams that we're doing to try and get like a, ba a base, uh, excuse me, a benchmark to use as a baseline to measure future um, growth and how effective we are at talking to patients. And the main thing that comes to mind with this is how we're always talking to our teams about the importance of selling a year's supply. Uh, it's better for the patient in terms of, you know, not overusing their contacts and their eye health. It's better for the practice, less administration time and uh, more, you know, kind of direct sales right at the time instead of waiting three or three, three or six months to make another sale. And so what I like about the contact lens page for our practice is in particular, uh, showing us how how well we're doing with the yearly supplies and then looking at, you know, what training we provide to our team to be more effective with it as time goes on and then coming back and, and tracking again on how we did, how we're doing currently. I also like the uh, percent daily contacts. We talk to our patients a lot about the health benefits of daily wear and, uh, you know, here we have an opportunity to look at how we're doing with our daily disposable sales. It, it's really, it's, it's such a wealth of information here. The other thing I, I like to go into is that, you know, we can sort this by doctor. And again, you know, these are critical areas. So when you're looking at these numbers and you want to know why, one of the things uh, we've been most proud of with Edge Pro is it doesn't just tell you what's going on. It's, you, you'll, you're going to find out why. So in a multi-doctor uh, location or a multi-location practice with multiple doctors, you're able to sort this out and see who your contributors are, you know, who are the folks that you want to sit down and talk with and say, hey, how can we help? And you want that to be done in a very proactive way. This isn't, hey, you're doing a bad job. This is, hey, I see we need help here. Let's figure out how we can help each other. So very, very proactive tools to look at. The other part of the contact lens screen, this is the bottom of it here, where it shows the number of boxes sold, the number of months that are sold, and obviously the top style percentage. So there's just a, a wealth of information here for, for people to play with. Um, and, you know, candidly, despite the influence of the internet and availability and all the big box commercial retailers, independents still control the majority of contact lens supplies to patients. And so, you know, for us not to be tracking this is, is really just giving the money away. So I would put on that, that list, uh, another item would be, you know, the year supply percentage and um, for tracking. Hey, do you Jay, agree, Larry? I, yeah, I do. And I want to jump in there. You mentioned something really important that I found in my own practice is, you know, sorting it by the doctor and, um, you know, being a doctor who employs other doctors, oftentimes uh, the employee doctors don't, they don't want to feel like they're selling from the chair. And I totally get that. And I also recognize that the way we talk to our patients in the exam room is gonna have a major influence on the choices that they make or don't make when they leave the exam room. And so we have a tremendous power as, as doctors in the exam room to uh, help make the patient make educated good decisions for themselves. And so when I try to, when I look at the information by doctor, if I see one of my doctors uh, underperforming with yearly supply sales, then it's a it's good opportunity to talk to the doctor and say, hey, what are you saying to these patients, and and how are they how are you coming across, and what are you getting that feedback from when you talk about contacts and you know the importance and value of it buying a year supply, and uh, it's interesting that if we can take the stance that we're actually helping the patient when we educate them uh, to buy a year supply, even in the exam room, then oftentimes that that perspective can help the patient make a better decision and, and everybody wins the practice the patients and um, you know the staff for having less work to do over the long haul I totally agree Larry the doctor has the power to really support the value of, of the relationship uh, <clears throat> for the patient with the practice and the whole team and so yeah tell me everything that's said in the exam room is it has uh, a different underline to it I totally agree with that. And, and, and that pertains to so many other areas of, you know, the concept of uh, patient prescribing. Um, <clears throat> as we keep moving on, we're going to uh, 
go from, from now we've gone from business overview to opportunities. We just did the contact lenses on the clinic overview, and now we're looking at the optical overview. And the first thing we're gonna look at in optical overview is the frames. So we're gonna click on frames, and that's gonna take us to this area here. Um, again, on top, you're able to sort by date range, and um, you'll see in the top right-hand corner, you're able to sort by plan and by staff member. We'll talk about that in a moment. I personally, when I'm looking at this, the first thing I look at is the average frame sale. To me, that is <clears throat> um, the golden goose. And, and you know, I, I still visit about 35 states a year, uh, visiting practices all over the country. And with that, I can say that that number should be north of $100. If that number is below $100, <clears throat> unless you're a very, very Medicaid-driven practice, um, <clears throat> that's where those numbers should be. In this case, the practice is at 137, which is a very strong number, by the way, and it's a good number. Um, <clears throat> the area that I take that to is down here, where again, we're looking at patient's own frames and zero dollar frames. And we, we talked about the money before, uh, what that was worth, but let's do a, another type of math with this for the moment and say that from the 670 frames that we looked at, uh, that, that are patient's own frames, and from the 773 frames, that are zero dollar frames. Let's say our goal was just to, to attack a third of it over a period of time, not quickly, but over a period of time. Well, that would mean that you had 200 from patients own frames and 200 reduction from zero dollar frames times the average amount of money a patient's spending, $137. That means there's almost $55,000 on the table here. So and that's how critical this type of information is. And then when you look over, you see there's 2,400 frames sold. That tells you, you know, pacing yourself, if it's over a 12-month period of time, that you, you're selling 200 frames a month. You should be buying 200 frames a month. And consequently, <clears throat> you have your top 10 list on the right-hand side. But if you want to know how to impact that and how to help your team, sort it by plan, sort it by staff member, so that you know who and how to help. Larry, when you're working with your team, how are they fluctuating in these numbers? How are they handling these numbers? Yeah, well, with our team, um, we are looking at the, and I, and I see that in your custom date range at the top that you're looking at the first 11 months of this year. And um, Correct. Oftentimes, yeah, oftentimes we're looking at uh, year to date, kind of close to what we are here. And uh, we're using this information to see, you know, how are we doing with the total? It comes down to frame board management. I know that's a big uh, piece for you, uh, yeah. Jeff. And we're looking at, uh, you know, how, how many frames do we have in our optical displayed? How many turns do we want for the year, uh, for the, you know, entire frame inventory? And, you know, how we're doing year to date and how we're comparing year to date to the last year, same time period. And so we're gathering a lot of information about how we're doing with our frames and how that relates to the overall revenue in the practice. That's great. And frame board management is such a big area <clears throat> and the mixture of that. Um, I apologize, everybody. My throat's a little dry today, so I'm sorry you're, you're getting a little scratchy here. But um, so, so this is definitely a screen that, that, again, you know, and one of the reasons why we're talking about it today, the first thing I look at is the average frame sale. Um, and I'm looking for it to get it north of 100. And obviously, we're talking about patients' own frames and zero dollar frames. And now Larry's obviously spoken about how this pertains to board management strategies, which, by the way, you should never be complacent with. You know, however you handled your board management strategy a year or two ago doesn't mean that's the way it should be next year. So you should always challenge yourself on assessing your product mix, your pricing strategy, um, um, you know, and really assessing your 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 geography, you know, that you're mixing your community and what's taking place. I know in, in my practice in New York, we've got Amazon coming to our backyard in Long Island City. And, you know, we're already making plans to you know, ask yourself, you know, what else are we going to need to provide? You, you would think that anybody can get anything they want on Amazon, but hey, all the people that are going to be working at that company, um, they're going to shop locally. So all the businesses in the area are now regrouping and say, okay, what do we need to do to, to take care of that? And we should always do that for our patient base. As we keep scrolling along, we're gonna look at lenses now. And uh, in the lens area, um, again, uh, just like the frame area, we've got the critical areas we wanna look at, total pairs of lenses sold, well, that, that's great to understand when you're talking with your lab. Um, Anti-reflective percentage or transitions, blue light, second pairs, progressive stats, 
Larry, how, how does your team work with this? And, and how do you uh, work with your team to, for them to get this information? Yeah, well, they, uh, they all have their own login. I know that Edge provides different levels of uh, information that can be seen based on what the uh, owner allows them to have access to. And in my practice, I give them pretty much full um, ability to see the information. I don't want, you know, for me, it's, it's, I want them to be able to access the information and I want to share it with them so that they can feel a level of ownership in the practice. And I think that is a decision that the specific owner with the edge software has to decide for themselves. Uh, that's just my own personal opinion on it. As far as um, how we use this in our practice, uh, we look at these numbers on this display screen as uh, by staff and kind of get a sense of who's performing where. Uh, we look at it by plan to determine if we want to continue with all the plans that we currently use or if it's time to consider dropping a plan. Uh, when we look at it by staff, if we see, you know, let's say we see one of the staff members uh, doing really well with multiple pairs, uh, we're going to look down at the second pair percentages uh, in the center bottom column here and, uh, you know, ask that person, what are you doing? What are you doing that's effective that is uh, helping you sell multiple pairs of glasses? And what can you share with your teammates to help bring their percentages up? And so it's a really cool opportunity to collaborate and to you know people usually know in the practice who's doing really well on a certain thing who might be struggling and this kind of gets it out into the air not to have any shame or guilt but just more so to help bring each other up and help improve each other's performance yeah uh, very first of all um getting your team access and making sure that they're seeing the numbers is is definitely step one um, i know many years ago uh when we first launched our, our dashboards, <clears throat> um, people were a little intimidated by it. They were like, oh my God, people are going to know what I'm doing. Uh, but over time, I think what people realize now is uh, personally, individually, each person needs to know what they're doing in order to understand how to bring value to their role and, and to the company. So uh, it actually <clears throat> is a very positive thing. You should know how you're doing. It's not a negative judgment. It's always a positive judgment. And um, in this case, when we're looking at percentages, if we roll across the board, Larry, what's your goal for AR? Uh, we're not supposed to say AR, it's supposed to say non-glare <laughs> or crystal clear. Uh, Mark Hitton's uh, famous expression for crystal, crystal clear lenses. Um, <laughs> but um, uh, as, it, as it relates to uh, anti-reflective lenses, what, what's your practice goal? Yeah, so um, in looking at anti-reflective or whatever you choose to call it, we, we, all be, we actually use it as a foregone conclusion that the lenses will have that on it. I know in Europe, they don't even have lenses. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if this is 100% true, but from what I understand, that you can even purchase without AR at this point. And so we just kind of included, as we're talking about the lens, it's not something that's considered an add-on in our practice. And we end up doing really well, Jay. I think that we're uh, typically north of 95% on our AR we rarely sell a lens without it. So that's kind of that's how, huge. Yeah, that's how we look at it in our practice. That that's a great number. And and that's a great goal. I think probably, you know, my impression, you know, nationally the numbers are a little lower than that. Um, you know, but I think getting between seventy five and eighty five percent is absolutely achievable by anybody. And once you get above eighty five percent you know, I think it does become a foregone conclusion. It means your team is completely on board. Um, so I think that's the weather vane. Uh, 75 to 85 is, is an absolute must. Um, and once you're getting above 85, <clears throat> you really don't have to think about what's going on in the floor because it means your team is consistently providing the same uh, professional services and products for your patients. As we look at transitions percentage, <clears throat> as we said before, national average is at 25%. So if you're below 25%, um, you, you've got work to do, um, but I've seen practices that are as much as 35 and 40 percent. So the numbers are very, very attainable. You know, I will say that there's varied opinions on the value of transitions. I've heard all kinds of talk about it, um, and I'm Larry. I don't know how you feel about this, but I don't feel I have a right to influence my patient with my own personal opinion as to how I may like or dislike a feature. It's my professional responsibility to make sure the patients are aware of all the features that are available for them because I can't live their life. You know, do you agree with that way of uh, addressing it? 
Yeah, I do, Jay. And I think that's a really important point, too, because our opticians also have their own biases. And it's really important that we don't let our own personal biases affect what we're offering the patients. I can remember a time when uh, we were dispensing a pair of transitions in one of the practices that I was an employee at before I opened my own practice. And there was another patient sitting there getting uh, her glasses dispensed as well. And the patient that was patient A, let's say, who was getting their glasses did have transitions. And the optician was explaining the benefits of transitions. And then patient B looked at uh, their optician and said, well, you didn't even offer me that. How come I didn't get that chance to have that on my lenses? And so we really wow. don't want that. Yeah, we, we don't want that scenario to play out in our practices. Uh, we don't want to let our own personal biases uh, maybe prevent us from uh, providing something that might give a patient value. And so we talk a lot to our opticians and even our doctors and other staff members, uh, since we are a team, about their own personal biases so that we can kind of sniff out what might be important to be training on and uh, to be discussing with our individual team members so that they are kind of objective when they're providing their education to the patient. Yeah, absolutely a key key role here. Another item here is the blue light lenses, which you know really over the last five years has become its own category. And there's such diversified thinking about this across the land and which products to use. You know, that being said, um, in the blue light category, it warrants tracking it now. There is credibility to the value that this product will bring a patient. And most folks will say to me, Jay, you know, how many should I be selling? You know, or how much should I be doing? If you, well, if you're just starting the Blue Light Initiative and, and you just fit, I'm going to say, two patients a week to get started as a goal for your team, you know, start somewhere. Pick a number. Ask your team, how many pairs a week should we be addressing that? So maybe it's eight or ten pairs a month, you know, for the first couple of months just to get started. But over time, selling Blue Light Protection should be a daily occurrence. And, you know, whether you adopt it as a, in my opinion, whether you adopt it as, you know, as important as uh, non-glare lenses or not, it should play a significant role in your practice as we continue to move forward. Um, any thoughts on blue light strategies, Larry? Yeah, well, you know, our patients are getting bombarded by messages in the media about blue light protection. And so, uh, you know, it's important that we're also talking to our own patients about it so that they, you know, hear us on the forefront of technology. Uh, but, you know, the way that we look at it, and this starts in the exam room for us is, uh, and sometimes even in the pretest with our medical assistants, but we're asking the patient, how many hours per day on an average day do you spend on a device? We're careful not to say a computer because people use all devices of all types. And so when they start to That's add more, yeah, I mean, words, the words that we choose, we really look at um, in, in terms of what information we're gathering and uh and disseminating and then you know as far as anybody above three hours we're going to advise a blue light filter so if they're on a device collectively per day on average three hours or more we're going to uh, talk to them about blue light and blue light filtering and uh, the important thing i think that i look at for this is uh you know we certainly don't want to feel salesy or, or appear salesy in the optical or even in the exam room obviously uh, but we want to say it in a way that's you know, takes the patient's best comfort and vision in regards. And so when we talk to patients about it, a lot of times uh, they get very excited about having another kind of tool in their belt to help with their tired eyes on the computer screens. Yep, uh, totally. The, and, and the other two numbers on here, second pair of percentages, obviously, um, you know, this is, second pair has been a huge, huge push for many years. Um, many of us are just bashful. Um, and, and, you know, really uh, get a little wishy-washy about talking about second pairs. We feel uncomfortable. Maybe patients, they feel they're spending too much money. But we kind of prejudge patients that way without really just addressing their needs and letting the patient make a great decision. Um, I think, Larry, you refer to this a different way than second pair percentages, right? Yeah, we like, to, uh, we like to refer to it as multiple pairs or alternate pairs. Uh, because we don't want to limit the patient into only two pairs of glasses. And again, I think that you're right on, Jay, when you say that we kind of prejudge our patients and think that they're only going to want one pair. And uh, I think that could be a potential downfall because a lot of times patients do want 
multiple pairs. They want multiple looks in terms of fashion, seeing glasses as an accessory. They might have uh, certain sports or vocations that they partake in that they want to benefit from different prescriptions like a near vision only or intermediate vision lens. And um, we're really there to, to fix whatever issues they might be having or to anticipate needs. And oftentimes we refer to glasses as like shoes. You're not gonna have one pair of shoes to do all the things that you wanna do throughout a week, just like you wouldn't wanna have one pair, wanna depend on one pair of glasses to do all the things that you do for work or for fun throughout a week. Uh, th that's for sure. The last number here, and, uh, and then both Larry and I can talk about this dashboard all day long, is progressive stats. And pro progressive stats is very important. And, and then I wanna tie this all back into our docs so, you know, this is a really cool number for me because this says, hey, 32.4% of our lens sales are done in progressives. Well, you know, it's very easy for all, any of us to run a report in our system and see, you know, is 32% of your patients above 40? You know, because if 50 or 60% of your patients are above 40 and only 32% of your lens sales are in progressive lenses, I'm going to ask you what's going on. That doesn't make sense to me, right, Larry? Yeah, there should be definitely be a clear correlation between the age demographic for a practice and the number of progressives sold. And so we see a big uh, gap there where, you know, we're seeing a lot of presbyopes and, you know, we're only providing a certain level of progressives within that. And I start to wonder, are my opticians uh, offering that as uh, an option, even for somebody who may not may have said that they were a non-adapt in the past? Um, you know, are we offering that as a regular, you know, our go-to multifocal lens or not? And so it does give us insight into kind of how we're addressing the patients when it comes to the presbyopic age demographic. Yeah, uh, completely. And, and by the way, everybody, your, um, uh, your buttons in the top right-hand corner show that you can sort this by plan and sort this by, sort this by staff member. Um, you could also, there are multiple ways to see how the doctors contribute to this. And I believe that it's important to, once you're looking at these numbers, to dice and slice a little bit. Uh, because if you're looking at a plan, let's say your AR percentage was at 50%, but you sort by your plans and you pick a VSP or an IMED plan, you'll notice that your plan numbers, when you isolate them, should always be higher than your average. Because people have entitlements and they tend to take advantage of more features and benefits because it costs them less money. And your AR, your transitions, your blue light, second pairs, all your numbers should be higher when you isolate the different plans than your total office average. And then of course you're able to see how each member of your staff contributes to that. Again, that's why the screen becomes so critically interactive for everybody. Um, as we keep uh, moving down the road here a little bit, we're gonna take you into another fun area uh, one of my favorite areas, and I know that is Katie's favorite area too, right, Katie? You still out there? <laughs> I'm here, yes. It's my favorite, favorite dashboard ever. Ever. Um, and we, we are actually privileged to have Katie uh, leading the teams at, at, at uh, GPN uh, Edge Pro, and, and Katie is uh, helping coordinate today as well with Kathy and everybody else. Um, we're going to talk about if you click on the enhance button, enhance edge marks, and then scroll down to practice breakout, it takes you to my favorite screen. And um, there's so many different ways we've all learned to use this information. So I'm just going to share with you one of my ways. And, um, what I like to do first is sort by plan. So in this case, let's say I picked VSP. So I'll click the all plans button there and then sort the VSP. And then I'll pick the staff member. In this case, I'll, I'll pick someone that some of you may have heard of. His name is Evan Kestenbaum. And, um, and Evan is the co-founder at, at GPN Edge Pro, and he's our COO and CIO. He's got more initials than I can count. But, uh, <laughs> um, and we're gonna take a look at the results here. And right away, the reason why I love to do this is because this tells me, in this case, what frames does Evan like to sell to VSP patients? And I think that's so important to see what are our habits. Sometimes we fall into habits we don't even realize we have. So VSP patients came in, you may favor one or two particular lines. An IMED patient comes in, you may favor a different one or two lines. Or, or just in general, man, care patients, you may pile them into one or two lines. The question is, those lines that you're supporting with the patient base, are they profitable for you? Because it's not a matter of whether or not you could sell the, the line. We all know that if you're excited about the line and you like the line, it's going to sell through. 
when we get bored, all of a sudden the lines are terrible lines. <laughs> but for the most part, when we do have these interactions, we have to make sure that they're profitable. You know, unless everybody wants to be a 501c3 non-for-profit status, um, we have to make sure we're doing right by the patient and by the business. So this is where we sort that out. And I love to play with this. The other area that this does really, really well is allows us to assess what's called true pricing. And for those who are unfamiliar with this terminology, this is a term that Evan and I came up with many years ago. Right now, uh, the dollars that are being listed here is, is listed under patient. All right, so all this money is how much is the patient spending? But when we click the true filter, which is right up here, it'll add to it the third party reimbursement. So, so, you know, three or four weeks later, after we've gotten all our money from third party plans, we can click the true filter, look back and say, what was the total value of the interaction for selling those frames? How much did we make? And in this case, just for argument's sake, I'm going to look at Calvin Klein here, CK, and it shows that we sold eight frames and the patient spent $112 total on eight frames, less than $20 a frame. So, you know, I know right away we didn't, we didn't make a lot of money here. Uh, yet, um, if we look at real Calvin, full Calvin clients, not the CK line, and that doesn't make CK bad, that may mean our pricing is bad. Um, you know, there's a lot of other things that go into it. This isn't saying a line is good or bad, but the result is not good. Here's eight, eight sales for regular Calvin Klein and patients spent $358. Larry, which, which frame would you rather sell? Yeah, it's a clear one. Uh, the Calvin Klein with the eight frames for 358, uh, is really producing more than three times the amount of income revenue than the CK Calvin Klein line below. And, uh, you know, for, for, when I look at that, you know, I just wonder, did it take any more time for us to sell the Calvin Klein versus the CK? I mean, to, to sell a frame is the amount of time it takes to sell a frame. So, uh, you know, we, we can use this page to find out which of our lines by staff member are performing well versus which ones are underperforming. Right. And, and in this case, in particular, Calvin Klein against CK, Again, not making a judgment on the lines or the value of having the lines, but just looking at numbers, it could be any line. You know, the average patient spent 20 bucks on a CK, the average patient spent a little bit more than 40 bucks on a Calvin Klein. That's not a far stretch. Um, so, you know, very small incremental steps get us to our goals overall. So one of the reasons, again, I like to use this is because I like to see what frame lines are we selling with which plans, and when we sell those frame lines, are we making money? So that's why I, I personally like this one. What else this screen does, which is really exciting for me, is not only does it allow us to sort by plan, by doctors, by staff member, um, not only does it have the true pricing that we discussed, um, it also allows us to sort by frames, spectacle lenses, contact lenses, patient exams. So this one screen can keep me busy all day. <laughs> um, but uh, my first go-to on this screen is always seeing, for board management purposes, what frames are we selling to which patients? And I give everybody a great example of a client we worked with years ago that bought a particular frame line and they sold uh, quite a few units, over 70 units of this frame line. It was not my recommendation to sell the frame line, um, but in, after they took it uh, in, within two months they sold 70 units, which is really great. Um, there was only one difficulty, we didn't make any money. <laughs> so it's not a matter of whether or not we could, we, the patients are gonna want them or we could sell them you have to be able to make a profit too. What ended up happening was this particular frame line was a number one seller at Walmart. Walmart was just a little ways down the road. I knew the MSRP on the frame line. I knew the wholesale cost and I knew the, uh, the percentage of managed care that was in this, this practice, which meant that mostly the managed care patients were going to buy it. And, and with that, that's exactly what happened. And at the end of the day, 50% of those frames lost money. 50% of them broke even and 50% of them made, 25% uh, of them made an average of, of uh, $20. So we ended up, even though we sold through on 70 frames, we didn't make any money, we actually lost some money. And that's why to me, this became a critical area in practice breakout, because we wanna know not just what are we selling a lot of, because when you're selling a lot of, then you have to ask yourself the next question, are we making money when we do it? Does that make sense, Larry? Yeah, it sure does. And I think that illustrates a really important point that the edge can help discover is, you know, what if even if we're selling a lot, if we're not making any 
uh, re you know, revenue on it at the, you know, after we've paid for our cost of goods, then is it serving the practice in the best way? Or is there another product that we can provide for our patients that would help us, uh, you know, as a practice grow? And so I think that, you know, using the software can really uncover some insidious habits or insidious, insidious lines, uh, particularly with frames that we're carrying that might not actually be serving the practice to its full potential. I like that word, insidious. I have to, I have to look up how to spell that word. <laughs> <laughs> Google it. No, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> hey, as, as we talk about um, you know, looking through the, the next steps, we, before we kind of summarize a little bit about what Larry and I have been talking about, Larry, why don't you share with the folks a little bit about some of your strategies and thoughts in running your practice and, and a little bit about your background. You, you keep pretty busy these days, and I know you've done a little consulting and a little speaking as well. Yeah, so, um, you know, I, uh, I work with a, a wisdom sharing group, and, um, you know, I also go to a lot of conferences to uh, keep my learning happening and, and hopefully can help others uh, do the same. And a lot of it centers around things that, you know, a lot of things that I do in my practice centers around what I learn at these conferences, because I feel like as a private practice uh, owner, wanting to see private practice thrive in our country, we really have to be uh, innovative and um, up to date on the latest uh, ways to manage and run a practice so that we don't get swallowed up by either the big box stores. I know a lot of, uh, you know, private um, equity firms are moving into our industry as well. So it's important that we stay relevant. Uh, a lot of the information that I bring back helps me determine how I want to run my practice. And, you know, in particular with the edge, what we do once a month is that we well, first of all, we assign everybody a KPI, a key performance indicator to track. And so everybody in our practice without exception has, uh, you know, KPIs to track and these things can be anything that you, you pick, but for our practice, we, we do it by sales per optician. We're looking at the number of comprehensives uh, that are showing up uh, versus the number of comprehensives that we have available for our patients. We look at our percent retinal image capture rate. Uh, we look at our revenue per doctor uh, on a monthly basis. And the way we do that is we have a spreadsheet that we've developed that's really simple, and we just put in, you know, the month of the, of the uh, year, and then each person goes in before the monthly meeting, the first one of the, of the month, to put in the prior month's uh, information. And so that really gives us a, a way to, to look at real numbers. A lot of times we think that, you know, we might be doing a lot of retinal images and come to find out that we're, we're performing worse than we thought we were. And then it gives us an opportunity to say, well, what's going on there and how can we move the needle up on that? And what's our, you know, let's set a goal for next month and, and track how we do on, you know, real versus our goal. And so uh, I really like the, the software for that reason. Uh, we, we do kind of track this each month and at the end of the year for the year itself. And we, and it's, it's interesting because, you know, as we've done this, I start to hear conversations uh, as I'm walking through rooms about, well, how can we, you know, how can we increase our sales in the optical or, you know, the, the team starts to own the, um, the different things that they're, they're just, they're just kind of discussing and innovating themselves. And so I used to run my practice where I tried to kind of give direction on all these different things. And what I've come to learn is that oftentimes they'll come up with ideas when given the opportunity that are better than the ones that I would have thought of. And so it's pretty cool to watch the light bulbs turn on and it's pretty cool to uh, watch how their ideas translate into uh, changed performance in the practice. So getting the team involved is a really big uh, part for us. Um, I know that when I first started with, uh, with the Edge, Jay, it seemed pretty darn intimidating, all the different you know, screens and pages and ways to calculate and crunch data. And so, uh, you know, what I would say that was helpful for me is in my practice is to really just start on like one or two of the most meaningful uh, KPIs that are going to affect the bottom line and start there. You went over so many pages today that are so valuable. And uh, the reality of, of it is, is that throughout the weeks, throughout the week, any given week, we're, we're pretty busy as doctors, as, as, as business owners. And so uh, rather than be intimidated, you know, start simple with one, try and change one habit and one thing that you're tracking in your practice that's going to 
impact the bottom line the most. And from there, you can kind of build and get more in depth as you go along. I totally agree. Thank you for sharing all of that, Larry. I, as we kind of summarize and look towards a plan for 2019, I want to impress upon everybody, simplicity should be your plan. Uh, where most of us fail is trying to do too much too quick. And so you want to do very meaningful, thoughtful actions, uh, initiatives, um, and you don't have to do many of them. Uh, first of all, you know, uh, as Larry said, get your team uh, involved and make sure you're sharing your information with your team. Um, but it, again, if you want to go down to the very basics, if you only pick four initiatives, and I'm going to discuss a couple here, for the whole year, and you say to your team, okay, you all agree on doing these four particular initiatives over the course of 2019, you'll do one in first quarter, one in second quarter, one in third quarter, one in fourth quarter, you will be successful at the end of the year. If you want to get a little bit more ambitious, maybe you could do six initiatives and say, we'll do an initiative every other month. So every two months, we will deploy a new initiative, which gives your team 60 days to succeed with each initiative. I wouldn't go past those six. Uh, candidly, I think it's enough. Um, so, so what I'm telling you here is you know, take small bites of the elephant and just pick those couple of small things. And at the end of the year, you put 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 thousand dollars and more because you know larger size practice is going to put six figure money right down to the bottom line. And simply because you may have role played and scripted differently, simply because you you may have focused on a particular number. And once you are aware of these numbers, it, it's incredible. I'm going to tell you that engagement and empowerment equals results. Let your team be engaged, let them be included in what you're doing, let them be empowered so that they can help uh, design uh, the steps necessary uh, to correct and, and you will see fantastic results. So in our goals for 2019, I would tell you that I'm gonna give you just kind of Jay's numbers. You know, from the very beginning, when we're looking at the business overview, you wanna be green across the board. Um, you know, so if you're not green across the board, uh, jump into that. And that is, that. by the way, that is something that I check every week. That's, you know, I only spend about, I don't think I spend 10 minutes a week in my edge anymore uh, because it's very quick for me uh, now after doing it for so long. Uh, and also because my team, like your team, Larry, spends a lot of time in it as well. So I just look at high level things. But from these particular high level things I'm sharing with you, it allows me to understand what's going on in the business. Um, in this particular case, revenue per exam uh, in optical and clinic are critical numbers for me. Um, the second thing is the annual supplies of contact lenses. So uh, that's a number that's also very critical uh, to, to, as a judgment call as to what's going on in your business. And, and by the way, you might say, well, what is a good revenue per exam? That so varies dramatically because some practice are more medical, some practice are more retail, depends on when they're located, depends on what percentage of plans you have that are your patient base. So I'm going to tell you that, you know, across the country, those numbers will vary. Uh, I'm going to encourage you to say, uh, to look at all of your numbers with the following thought process. Always think of improving upon your own numbers versus always trying to see where you are against someone else's. So if your revenue per exam right now uh, in, in your practice is $250, then empower your team and come up with your team to get an answer on how to get to 275 or how to get to 300. Just, just bench yourself against your own numbers. It's the best way to grow. Um, as you continue to, by the way, if you're $400 in revenue per exam is in clinic and $100 revenue per exam is optical, so your, your revenue per exam is 500, which by the way, is the magic number. Overall, you want to try and get your revenue per exam above 500, but if 400 is clinic and 100 is optical, you don't have a functioning optical. So, you know, you really need to look at that. Um, and what's taking place. You want to balance. You know, traditionally today, 60% of our revenue is coming from the optical. So, you know, if only 20% uh, of your revenue per exam is coming from the optical, then, then there's an imbalance there. As you look to the next number that I'd like to think about, uh, like we said, yearly supplies of contact lenses, that's always a good focus. And here's the beautiful part about the supplies of contact lenses. There are so many great resources to help us uh, uh, attack that number. You know, through your contact lens distributors, through your alliances and buying groups, 
through consultants. There's many, many different ways to learn how to who address that number. But don't quit on yourself. Do whatever's necessary to stay at it. Uh, another area for me is always uh, opportunity. You know, we discuss zero dollar frames and patient zone frames on the opportunity area. Both those numbers should be below 15%. Your AR percentage, as we said before, for you not to be within the 75 to 85% area is, you know, uh, means that we're, we're just not doing the job. Um, and as Larry's practice is well above 90%, it, that is completely attainable. If we commit ourselves to, to making that happen, those are the right numbers. Um, and the uh, fourth item on the opportunities tab was transitions, which should be at, at 25 or above. Again, whether it's AR or transitions through your labs, through your, your lens brand uh, uh, consultants, uh, through, through other consultants, through your alliances and buying groups, there's so many resources to get help with this today. Um, that it's a shame that we don't take advantage of more of it. Um, average frame sale to me, another big item. The average frame sale we, we saw before was $137. That, by the way, is the average amount of money a patient spends. And, and so, and as I expressed to you before, you want that number to be north of 100. You want that number to be above $100. Um, those are, you know, some of Jay's uh, favorite areas uh, to look at. Uh, there is one area that I didn't show here today, and I'm just going to throw that in as a bonus, and that is your new and existing patient ratio, um, which you will find in your sales summary button. So if you go to your enhanced tab, I'm going to scroll back up here and uh, show you back with it. If you go to this enhanced tab, you go to this button here, sales summary. In the top right-hand corner of sales summary, it'll give you your new and existing patient ratio. Critically important number, again, another number I track uh, religiously, uh, in a mature practice, you know, four to five years or older, one third of your patients should be uh, new and two thirds should be existing. A brand new practice, obviously, your majority of patients are going to be new. So in that mature practice zone, you're looking for that one third, two third mix. And if you're not achieving that one third, two third mix, you may have uh, a faulty recall system. You know, in other words, your, your folks aren't following a proper procedure. You may have high cancellations or no-shows that you're not addressing. There's lots of different ways to address those numbers. Or you may not have, you know, your website's not up to date. You're not doing social media properly, so you're not getting in a new patient. So that's another area I like to look at. Larry, any, anything else you, you, you can think of? Uh, we're, we're, I know we're flooding everybody with a fire hose here, but any other thoughts? Yeah, I, I really liked what you said about uh, comparing yourself to yourself. I've fallen into the trap of comparing myself to, you know, other high-performing practices before I really started to dig in in my own practice. And, you know, I got a little uh, disappointed and, um, you know, I, I think it was important when somebody said, it actually reminds me of John Wooden, the uh, famous UCLA basketball coach. And he really wanted his uh, team, team members to be the best versions of themselves and not compare themselves to other teammates. And so I think that wow. if we put ourselves as a practice uh, onto itself and how we can be the best practice we can be, the best version of our own practice, and then drill that down in even deeper to say we want our team members to be the best versions of themselves that they can be without necessarily comparing themselves to other teammates, and we can really get to the essence of peak performance, which, uh, which is really – you know, on a daily basis, thinking of each day as a masterpiece and how we can improve upon our performance from the day before. And the edge is such a great software because it lets us uh, see measured proof of how we're doing. And we all know that what we measure will improve. Uh, that, that you can only manage what you measure. That, that's absolutely the, uh, the expression to use. Larry, I can't thank you enough for playing with us today. And, uh, and uh, sharing some of your insights and what you know, all you've accomplished. Um, hey, everybody, our emails are up here for both Larry and myself. Uh, please feel free to, uh, obviously, you, you've sent messages through the chat line to our team, and we're going to be responding with that. So, and, you know, Inside Edge, there's a live chat there. There's always someone waiting to talk to you. Um, but you could also, if you have a question specific for Larry and myself, please feel free to use our emails and, and ask us some questions, and uh, we will follow up uh, with you as well. Hey, um, so Katie, Kathy, uh, do we have any other questions or thoughts that we want to throw out there? Uh, yeah, Jay, we actually got another question just a minute ago. So what would be a good capture rate goal for a practice? 
I love that question. That's one of my faves. First, let's define capture rate. Uh, industry traditionally defined it as pairs of lenses. Uh, and so as when we define it as pairs of lenses, you should be in the 80 percentile. Uh, but, but I personally like to define capture rate as complete pairs of eyeglasses. Um, uh, sadly enough, it takes two and a half refractions to sell one pair of eyeglasses today. Uh, so that's lower than a 40 percent conversion rate on complete pairs of eyeglasses. The goal for complete pairs of eyeglasses is north of 65%, above 65%. Um, but I'm gonna put a qualifier in there and I don't wanna confuse anybody. Some of our practices are more medically inclined. And if you're more medically inclined, you will be doing more refractions during the course of the year that are not what I call eligible refractions. And there are ways that we can filter these now um, we create a code, a C code and an M code, so a C99 and M99, and basically if it's a medical refraction for a follow-up, we'll code it as a, an M, M code, M99, so it's a refraction code with an M in front of it, uh, versus a comprehensive exam, which is a refraction code with a C in front of it, so that Edge Pro will then filter it, and that will give you the cleanest number of eligible refractions to have the cleanest conversion rate. I did work with a practice, a very high medical practice, and the conversion rate was 37%. And when we did this exercise, we found out the conversion rate was well above 60%. Uh, so we just had to clean out uh, what we call eligible refractions. But overall, your goal is north of 65% for what we call eligible refractions. Great, awesome. Any I other? Uh, not that has come through right now. It doesn't look like it. Um, just so our attendees know, um, me and Katie will be on for a few more minutes so we can answer any questions to you either by chat or by email. Um, and so thank you, Jay and Dr. Golson, for being with us today. We really appreciate it. Thanks for having us. Yeah. And so um, uh, thank you, everybody. And by the way, everybody, Kathy, uh, uh, a, a former customer of ours who's the heading up our services department, Katie, um, actually interestingly enough, used to work with Larry and uh, also a former customer of ours. What's interesting about our team at GPN is the folks you're talking to live the same life you do. You're talking to people that actually are doing and have done everything you're doing. So you, you have people that understand your questions, they understand the vocabulary, and not only are they gonna teach you how to use the edge, they're probably gonna share with you some of their personal insights. So we're very, very blessed to have, uh, to have this incredibly experienced team on board and to have folks like Larry and others who share their insights with us. So thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Jay. Um, and then we, these, work, these will be recorded and we will send out an email to let you guys know where you can see them. And actually, we just got one more question come in, Jay and Larry. Um, what exactly are zero dollar frames and the advantage, advantages and disadvantages of them? Great question. So we define zero dollar frames as frames that patients have spent zero on. In other words, they've used their managed care entitlement. And let's say the managed care entitles them to a frame worth $120. We give them a frame and we don't charge them any money. So the patient spends zero, but we give them a frame. Those frames are, you know, very often frames that we don't generate profit on, which is why it's so important to uh, come up with a strategy on showing patients value in other frame products because if your patients don't spend any money, you're not gonna make any money. Awesome, great. Well, thank you guys again and thank you for all our, all our attendees. Um, I am putting in the uh, chat window a link to our Survey Monkey. Um, so please do that. It's just a five question survey. It just takes you a, a minute to do. So we love to hear our feedback from you guys. And we, of course, like I said, we'll be on for a few more minutes to answer any questions. Um, we do look forward to seeing everyone again next Tuesday at 1 p.m. Eastern for our final segment, Best Practices for Setting and Hitting Your Goals in 2019. Uh, we will have our guest speaker, Rebecca Johnson, on this one. Um, and of course, you can reach out to Jay or Dr. Golson with any other questions, or you can reach out to us directly at customercare at gatewaypn.com. And thank you guys. Wow, like Rebecca this. Johnson is a rock star. <laughs> she is amazing. One of my favorite people on the planet. You cannot 
you, you cannot love, you can't not love Rebecca Johnson. She is the most ex excited, energetic, wonderful teacher I think I've ever met, and uh, consider her a dear friend. She's she's helped just so many people. So I'm really excited that she's joining us as well. Well, thank you guys again, and thank and we really appreciate you taking the time with us today. Have a great one. Thank you. Thank you.